Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Muhammad Saluji and welcome to all ITV viewers on the special edition on the Saturday morning. It's a live program that we're talking about uh, the religious implica tax implications as we have advertised for religious institutions. Um, the uh, precursor to this program was really a press statement that was issued on the 26th of January this year uh, by the uh, South African Revenue Services around an intervention that they're planning to do for religious institutions. And given the very privileged position that South African Muslims enjoy in this country with lots of religious freedom and lots of benefits in terms of the tax legislation, uh, we thought it's a very, very apt topic to talk about this morning. So before I dive into the topic, I want to first introduce my very esteemed panel of guest speakers. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Mark Kinnan. Uh, Mark, welcome to uh, ITV. Um, I yeah. believe it's your first time uh, on our channel. It is, and good to be with you and, and your viewers. Congratulations on the double appointments over the past two, two months. Strength to you, and, uh, to, to you and your team in your new position and role. Yeah, it's acting, of course, and so we just want to do our best for the country. Uh, for those of you that don't, and I'm sure many people know, Mark is probably the most famous person at SARS as we speak. Uh, Mark is uh, acting commissioner. Uh, Mark, I do apologize if I get some of your titles wrong, uh, but he's uh, currently the acting chief officer also for business and individual taxes. That's a role he took also over about two weeks ago. Uh, and before that was the group executive uh, relation management with, within business and individual taxes. Mark, you've been with SARS for more than 34 years, so lots of institutional memory. And also, I believe you've been part of the very team uh, that uh, today we have as the tax exemption unit. And I believe you've also been part of the drafting team of the legislation, which is around almost 19 years with us. Correct, and uh, had the privilege of, of framing the legislation, which was a fundamental shift from about three lines in tax legislation to quite a number of pages and a schedule which is attached to it. So, yes, yes it's been a privilege to, to, to be part of that and see the growth of the focus on, on tax-exempt entities uh, in the country. Thank you for making time. We know your time is very valuable for, for joining us today. Good. Uh, sitting next to Mark is uh, Mr. Ahmed Juma. Um, Ahmed is an independent tax and legal um, practitioner. He specializes uh, also in public policy. Um, he's previously head of financial services at SARS, uh, was a chief director at the South, at South African National Treasury, uh, on the tax policy side, was also senior manager at KPMG and was head of tax for WTS. I uh, hope that's right, Ahmed. Uh, Mohammed. Welcome, Salam, Ahmed. And Ahmed also holds the degrees of BA, LLB, HDEP tax, HDEP international tax. And Ahmed, you'll bring today some of your experience as a practitioner in this particular area. Well, I must confess, uh, um, Mark has certainly created a level of complexity in t the tax law for us, so now we have met the culprit. <laughs> <laughs> well, <And> then, <laughs> uh, thank you, Ahmed, for joining us. And uh, next uh, to, to Mark, uh, sitting on his left-hand side, is Mr. Zainul Kaji. Many of you would know uh, Uncle Zainul, as I refer to him. He's uh, the founding CEO of OCAF, qualified chartered accountant. Uh, and Uncle Zainal, you're going to bring really the experience from within the sector itself, with OCAF being a public benefit organization and being quite widespread with, with, with its network with other PBOs in, uh, in, in the sector. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. And I think uh, in 2002, we had this tech seminar when uh, Mark King actually uh, brought out this, this wonderful legislation yes. for us, actually, mm. which, which, which I think really spurred on a lot of NGOs to actually uh, register as public benefit organizations and I think it has created a lot of uh, opportunities for NGOs to actually prosper and, and, and grow in that sense. Yes. But thank you. Thank you for, for, for joining us, Uncle Zainal. So, so let me start, uh, listeners by, and viewers, by just introducing a bit more around the topic. Uh, I mentioned that there was a press statement that was issued on the 26th of January. And really that press statement came from SARS, talking very much around the non-compliance in the religious sector. Um, it was after an investigation that SARS had done with the CCL commission, CRL commission, apologies. Um, and uh, there were a lot of uh, areas of non-compliance that was detected by SARS. A lot of what SARS put in this press statement as activities of a self-enriching nature, which goes against the very spirit of the legislation and what we want to do. 
Um, and there were other areas that really concerned SARS from what this press statement uh, mentions. For example, uh, you know, uh, distributing funds when you're not supposed to, or in instances where um, there are trading activities that are being by, done by the religious institutions for non-compliance with, with the tax legislation around that. And the other area that was picked up was also the uh, PAYE, where there is an obligation where you are employing people to, 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 to pay over the PAYE and register for PAYE, irrespective of the fact that you're a PBL. And, and, and at the end, there was also a bit of a clover leaf that was put out there where it was mentioned that certainly the PBOs need to come forth uh, and do necessary disclosures through the VDP program. So I think the idea is to really try and unpack that press statement um, uh, to, in today's discussion. So, Mark, let me start off by you uh, asking you this question. Can you give us some context around where this press statement really comes from, a bit around the investigation, and, and what are the key things that really sit behind the issues you guys discovered? So, very importantly, I think we're all aware of the Commission's inquiries that they held in the course of last year and a lot of uh, negativity in the media pertaining to certain activities uh, mm. within the religious sector in specific areas where there seems to be abuse of people mm. uh, for self-enrichment. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, taking monies uh, where it's intended to be for the public benefit or the yes. public good, as I'd like to see, yeah. Uh, and being used for actually fleecing people's pockets, mm -hmm. uh, living lifestyles that go way beyond which would be normal for a sector like this. Yes. So that was the starting point, and obviously mm -hmm. we are specifically mentioned in the mm -hmm. Commission's report uh, pertaining to our actions. I think our actions go way beyond the Commission's mm -hmm. report. Uh, and in looking at it, we've looked at a, at, at a number of areas in terms of compliance, but the starting point, I think, was for us the, the fact that many religious institutions probably are unaware of their obligation to be mm. registered for tax. Mm. And I think that's the mm. starting point and the route that we need to start mm. with, mm. because a, a religious institution established uh, it can be established in various ways, but if they are not established as a, com a non-profit company or as a trust, mm. they are established as an association of persons which yes. is deemed to be a company which mm. has an obligation to register with SARS before we get to exemption yes. as such. So that's the starting point. So there's an obligation to register and most people don't understand mm. that. Mm. Uh, so I think our register is hugely understated. Yes. We have many entities that are not there. Interestingly enough, we're finding uh, a number of religious institutions trading as companies, mm. uh, which worries me a little bit, but yes. we, we, we need to, to, to unpack that a little bit more. Yes. And the second aspect then was the issue of, of, of specifically, which you highlighted, the issue of, of, of the, 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 the uh, registration for tax exemption. Mm. People don't understand that there is a benefit. Mm. Um, there is a benefit that we give that the, the receipts and accruals of a PBO are exempt. Yes subject to certain conditions, obviously, mm. uh, and there's certain restrictions in terms of trading mm. which uh, a PBO can uh, undertake. And I think it's very important, moment to, to, to go back to the start. Mm. The first set of legislation that started was to restrict trading in toto, mm. that there was no trading allowed. Yes. We then, and even engaging with the Muslim community and, and understanding trading and obviously the context of, of interest and, and the various things, you can't have a total bar of a religious yes. institution trading. We've got the let out, which is currently there. Mm. It's obviously got a de minimis rule mm. after which it, it, it be becomes taxable. Yeah. Now, I know there are certain debates which we can enter mm. into in that regard, mm. but it doesn't prevent you from trading and doing activities in order to, to fulfill your obligations yes. in terms of the PBO. But very importantly, and this has been one of our challenges in looking at the, at, at the cases, we are finding religious institutions where actually the public benefit activity is not the primary purpose of the mm. entity. Uh, and, and that worries us. So when the primary purpose becomes something other than in this case, let's say, doing religious work or school work, etc., mm. that would worry us that um, people become more focused on the trading and all the energies are expended towards the trading activity. Yes. I've got a question, is that still a religious institution? Mm. But it's a question we've got to ask. Yes. The next key issue is that people were taking funds from the entities and not paying pays you earn on them. Mm. So we have found a number of examples where people are actually... Uh, it, taking monies mm. out and the, they deem it to be of a capital nature. They say it's donations to mm. them. Uh, and with respect, that's, that, is, that is borderline fraud. Yes. Uh, and if I may not say fraud, because you are trying to, to guise something in a different guise to get money into your pocket. 
the whole principle of the legislation that was put in place was to enshrine the, the, the principle of benefiting the public, that the people who got fiduciary responsible are, are accountable, very importantly, and that they are not taking anything that's beyond reasonable for the work they are doing. So the, the whole issue of reasonable remuneration, yes. uh, that, that you are not taking, you can't be paying the, the same that you would give a, 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 a a person, for instance, at a large corporate list mm. on the JSC, paying that type of salary uh, to the person who's running a small PBO. And that's just plain ludicrous, That and it's happening. Mm. And we're finding even though it's happening, and they're not paying pay as you earn. Yes. So it's a double whammy. I think they are not, it's, the remuneration is not commensurate with the services yes. that are being rendered. It's out of line with the norm within the industry. And then on top of that, the, the, the cherry on the top is that they don't pay pay as you earn on Correct, it. Yes. So they're getting away with it. So and I think the issue that we want to debate as well, we're giving a fiscal benefit of an exemption. Indeed. Just comply. Yes. And let's talk about how we comply. Indeed. So, Mark, I think that's a great introduction and thank you very much for just sharing a bit of that background. I've been told by my producers that we're almost on to our first break. Um, so, so before we just get on to that break, uh, Maybe just a few comments, if I can, from um, you know, from from my side, on especially I think the issue around the, the the benefit of the dispensation and the compliance, and I think that's what we want to tease out today is, where are those areas of compliance that we really need to focus on? Uh, yes, it's a lot of the paperwork, but without doing that properly, the re our religious institutions risk failing the legislation. And I think the good example is the PUIE that you've mentioned that. Mm. It's a double jeopardy for SARS and True. the country because not only are we getting the dispensation in terms of exempting the income, but we're then abusing it True. by drawing huge salaries, which is a breach of the legislation itself, as we know, mm. but not then complying with the PYE legislation. True. I think it's right time now for us to take that break. And as soon as we're back, we will then hand over to the rest of our panelists. Thank you, Mark. Welcome back to all of our viewers on ITV. We're talking taxation of religious institutions and I'm going to move over to our next panelist. Uh, uh, Ahmed, uh, you heard Mark uh, and what he's and SARS senses around some of the challenges that we're facing with religious institutions. As an independent practitioner, what have you found out there in terms of your experience? It's, it's very interesting, Mark's uh, comments for, as a tax administrator. Uh, replicates what we find as practitioners out in the, mm -hmm. in, in, in the field. Um, now, there's one of two types of practitioners. It's either you're a practitioner who's going to tell your client what they want to hear, or you tell them exactly where things are at. And I find that uh, generally the starting point is quite agreeable with Mark, that it's a matter of education. I do know that the Muslim organizations organize religion as it were, did publish extensively in the, in the very early years and ongoingly mm -hmm. on ma material on how to comply mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. There were initiatives among Muslim professionals to ensure compliance. But I think there's, there's also a dimension where people have genuine intent mm -hmm. and they get involved in, um, in charitable activity uh, motivated by a religious impulse, mm, mm. Uh, a humanitarian mm. impulse, an mm. altruistic mm. impulse. Mm. But then ultimately what happens is that they don't quite take care of or, uh, or even aware of their obligations. Mm. Mm. And that's where the problem yes. lies. Mm. So I think we need a more extensive education campaign so that we can distinguish between, and this is for all religions, we can distinguish between those who are genuinely ignorant and those who are willfully ignorant. Mm. Because I think there's a lot of willful ignorance out there as well, mm. which is uh, used as a disguise for people to enrich themselves. So religious charlatanism is something that is, is starts manifesting mm. in the willful intent mm. as opposed to, to mm. people having a genuine yes. intent. Insofar as compliances go, I think that the problems that PBOs face are the same as those of any business, for example, although they're not businesses, and that is a cash flow problem. So cash flow can become an issue in PAYE compliance. Mm. And I think what we need to look at is we need to look at some flexibilities around that. 
um, in such a way that it doesn't breed greater non-compliance, but we do need to have people behave in a way where they can pay and should pay, but they should be able to pay given that their the mm. circumstances mm. permit. On the VAT issue, um, I think there's a lot of gaming in the VAT area where there are claims that don't, are not necessarily justified. But then on the other hand, the flip side of it all is there's a tremendous amount of ignorance by those who are actually eligible for registering for VAT and not registering. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think one needs a, a bit of balance. And then the most glaring issue, which is a policy issue really, and makes compliance a bit of a problem, is the trade issue. Mm. Because we have an injunction in the Quran against interest and all investment income is tax free for a PBO. Mm. But we have then the ob obverse of that, which is that trade is halal for you. Mm. And then we have the wakaf system, which mm. Zainal can talk mm. about, which is an endowment that funds a sustainable mm. charity. Mm. So those are the broad pressure points I'm finding mm. uh, in, in practice. In your experience, I mean, the, the legislation itself is fairly complex. And we don't have to go into all the technicalities. It's 19 years that this legislation has been around. Clearly, awareness is an important uh, area. But do you think there's more that we can do in just getting the community to basically understand the legislation? You, you cherry-picked a few very specific issues. But even just the issues around how do you become compliant? And what are the things you need to, to be compliant with as a PBO? Uh, you know, that's the, you know the getting out of that starting block type issues at the outset, do you think there's still a need for our community to, to get involved in that particular area? I think there definitely is. I think that where you have a head in the sand approach, mm. you just compound the problem. And eventually you do yourself a disservice because it goes to credibility. Mm. And SARS is not going to regard you as credible. In fact, tax practitioners mm. don't regard mm. you as credible mm. if you, you give all variations of stories. So I think given that there is a system of MAF, I mean, the VDP is a system mm. where you can come clean. I think people should take advantage of that and come clean. Mm. I think that what is absolutely critical, though, over, overall and beyond this, is that you see the, 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 the kind of tax accounting tax uh, uh, and the pure accounting of it is one, one aspect from a compliance point mm. of view. But the more substantive issues are, are, arise around governance. Yes. And you know, the ability to distinguish between what is your property, even though you may have this altruistic intent, and what is not your property, and is clearly property of the PBO. Mm. So that's one area. The other area among Muslim uh, organizations is when, and I think it's a more general problem, is when do you issue a Section 18A deduction mm. certificate? Mm. From mm. Deduction from income tax. Yes. Now, we have a, pr a, a more substantive issue in the Islamic community, and that is that, you know, schooling, secular schooling, can be funded on a PBO basis. Mm. But when it comes to religious schooling, then that is not permissible. Mm. So, so, so that mm. is a point as well where mm. I think that if we look at the, 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 the overall uh, approach of the Commission for, for on Religion and mm, so on, mm. we have moral decay in South Africa. Yes. And, and I think that it's pretty much imperative that we start focusing on the fact that there is in religious yes. education a basis for moral regeneration yes. as well. I, I'm going to come back to, I think, some of the points you raised around the specifics around our religion itself and what we need to do going forward. But I want to bring Uncle Zainal in onto the discussion. Uh, Uncle Zainal, as CEO of OCAF, um, what has you, been your experience? Uh, you know, you're at the coal facing end uh, as a PBO in terms of compliance and having to do all the, the various uh, paperwork and getting your financials in place. What have been your challenges either as an organization or in your role as a much wider community-based organization with dealing with other PBOs on this particular area of tax exemption? Okay, I think first of all, uh, we need to say that uh, within the Muslim community, we have something like about 2,000 uh, organizations or institutions. Many of them are large organizations, and then many of them are just um, sort of uh, sprung up organizations mm -hmm. that do feeding mm -hmm. schemes and things like that. So mm -hmm. you, you've got quite a wide array of organizations. Uh, and, and that's where mm. perhaps some of the ignorance comes in mm. or some of the, yes. the laxity also comes in. 
But I think that uh, by and large, the larger organizations are pretty tax compliant, are pretty mm. uh, much in terms of getting their books mm. in order and so yes. forth. Uh, I also think that there, there, there is a lot of scope for more education. What I do find, of course, is that uh, the issue that Mark raised about uh, remuneration, mm. I think that many of our organizations uh, underpay staff rather than overpay. overpay. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them are actually on sacrificial sal salaries. Mm -hmm. Many of them are actually not remunerated. Correct. So I don't think we really have that problem mm -hmm. within the Muslim community. Uh, and, and I may stand to be corrected, subject to audits of uh, other organizations. Yes. So, uh, and, and we deal with a lot of organizations and uh, often the, the problem is uh, the lack of resources yes. and, and we have to look at uh, how we can actually resource those organizations as well. Yes. So uh, we, we do have that as uh, one of the major issues of, of resources and hence we have uh, you know the issue of funding other organizations as well yes. and uh, one, one of the requirements uh, I think of SARS is that uh, other organizations that you fund must be PBO registered as well. Mm. And, and I think that's where some of the difficulties come mm. in, mm. that you, you're dealing with organizations that may not necessarily be PBO compliant, mm. but rendering a, an excellent public service. Yes. So I think looking beyond the, uh, the, the, the technical side of it is looking at what service is being rendered out there yes. and, and, and ensuring that that service does actually happen. So where you don't actually f fund, for example, operational costs, but you're funding, uh, for example, a welfare project mm. or a borehole project mm. or uh, an education upgrade mm. pro yes. program or assisting uh, elders mm. facilities and so forth. You know? So those entities may not necessarily be uh, PBO registered, mm. but the benefit is actually going yes. down to those mm -hmm. uh, uh, indigent and poor and needy. Is, is there not a more uh, closer problem in that often the religious institutions within the Muslim community often wrap everything in the same? In other words, you know, religion versus cultural versus some of the humanitarian projects and, and a need there to try and almost bifurcate those into different compartments, uh, whether it's a different entity of establishing it so that you can then again, get the governance around that very clearly as to this is the religious arm, this is the social welfare arm, this is the humanitarian arm. And again, what's been your experience on that? And, and would that help or add to really the problem in yeah, terms of compliance? I think, I think generally speaking, uh, most organizations focus on specific areas. For example, Islamic Medical Association are focused on health care and improving health amongst poor and needy, yes. uh, or Al-Imdad looking at welfare, humanitarian work and so forth. Uh, then you've got the pure religious organizations, theological organizations that, that focus more mm. on that. Mm. I mean, you, you mentioned something about the schooling. Mm. And in my view, uh, the, 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 the schools that are operating as so-called Islamic schools or Muslim schools are not necessarily religious institutions. Mm. They all operate under the education department yes. and and they they bona fide educational institutions mm. they write the right. uh, uh, the national examinations mm. and all of that so so they fall broadly within that they they may have an islamic ethos and they may include mm. Um, mm. an islamic religious program as one particular program as part of their curriculum but by and large these are educational institutions and they need to be mm. Uh, PBO recognized. So uh, I think that's the kind of experience yes, that yes. we have. Good. And I think that uh, uh, what, what, we, what we need to look at also is uh, the issue of um, uh, donor deductions. Yes. We need to look at uh, how we can, uh, I, think, I think maybe just the, the point that, uh, you know, government always talks about public-private partnerships, yes. wanting civil society to be more involved uh, and, and, and this, is, this, has, been, this has been the history of OCAF over the centuries, that it has always played the civil society funding role. Yes. Uh, and not, not, I mean, starting 1400 years ago and in all 
literally all Muslim countries, mm. in all Muslim minority countries as well, uh, there is this uh, very strong ethic of funding civil society, of civil society funding, uh, okay, uh, funding public uh, okay. uh, uh, projects, even projects such as hospitals, okay. yes. uh, libraries, roads, okay. bridges, things like okay. that as well. And, and we need to look at, uh, yeah. look at look at it more holistically. I've got to just pause there and again take another ad break. Uh, we've got to pay the bills and we'll pick the discussion up as soon as we're back online. Well, ben, welcome back to all of our viewers on ITV. This is a live program dealing with religious taxes or taxation of religious institutions. Um, we just heard Uncle Zainul talk around uh, some of the issues that the Muslim organizations face by virtue of the various activities uh, beyond just pure religion. Mark, I want to bring that particular point um, to you. Um, this focus and this, this press statement focuses very much around religious institutions, Correct. not the cultural or social wealth or humanitarian uh, uh, organizations or activities that are often conflated or combined into one body. What is your suggestion experience um, as to how do we deal with the complexities that are specific mm -hmm. and germane to religious institutions as opposed to the rest of the PBO uh, or activities organizations? So very importantly, religion by its very nature has got a cultural element mm. and very importantly has got a welfare element. Yes. Most religious organizations, by their faith, uh, their, their beliefs, uh, they have to do good work and, and be involved in the community, helping community, doing good. Now those are 18A mm. allowable. Yes but the religious, and it's a fine line sometimes. So that's the issue I think we need to touch on. So the law allows you to do a conflate, a, a, a mm. entity that does everything. Yes. You could have cultural activities, yes. you could have religious yes. activities, you could have uh, a welfare, a yes. charitable type of activities in one. The issue, what the law says there, is that you've got to now have a separate audit certificate for the 18A activities to mm. ensure mm. that when Mark gave a donation to the entity for that charitable activity, mm. that it was utilized for that, that it wasn't they used to, to, for, for the religious activity. Yes. And that fine line needs to be identified. And I think auditors might have a difficulty yes. in doing that. I, yes. I don't know. Mm. Uh, my recommendation to any entity out there, if you're thinking of starting, if we're looking forward, and I think we'll get in a moment with Ahmed how we go about it. Mm. But if you're thinking of starting and you want to 18A, but you're also a religious institution, rather separate the two yes. out and allow that you've got two separate legal entities. It's easier to administer. I think Ahmed said earlier that people establish these things and they forget there's this administrative burden. Mm. They mm. neglect it and then one day they get in trouble mm. and then there's the, the issue yes. needs to be dealt with. Rather upfront, separate the two, understand the complexity of 18A, mm. there's reporting obligations. I intend to bring in far more, mm. far more reporting obligations because there's abuse even of fictitious 18A receipts. Yes. Keep it separate. If you are in one entity and you're already there and you've got 18A, go back and double check that you're adhering to the scope of the law. Yes. And maybe there's a need for us to reiterate that. If we look mm. towards education, which mm. is primarily what we have for today, let's reiterate what are the obligations to ensure that you're doing the right thing administratively. Correct. We'll get to some of those compliance issues, but Mark, maybe even just for my own edification, why the preclusion for religious institutions for 18A <laughs> in the first place? Well, there, there's three specific areas specifically mm. excluded within mm. in the second uh, part of the ninth schedule mm. to the to the Income Tax Act, and that is religion yes. uh, and belief, obviously, and the related culture yes. and sport. Mm. Um, I think ultimately it comes down to the cost to the fisc. Mm. Um, and if one was to start giving deductions, you know, the, the giving to the religious sect in our country is huge. Mm. Uh, I don't know if the fiscus could have no. afforded it at the time. Uh, there's various models internationally. Mm. Um, it, it's something that Treasury would have to consider in terms mm. of their tax policy. But the cost would have been astronomical, I think, from a, t a, t a tax point of view. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Lord. So Go ahead, yes, Uncle Zim. On, on the same point, uh, I mean, religion plays quite a significant role in, in South African Correct. society. And uh, the religious uh, organizations are really carrying 
a lot of state burden, if I may say. So why should religious organizations uh, and religious institutions in, in uh, particular be excluded from the tax benefits? Yeah, look, yeah, that, that would actually simplify the Section 18A of course, issue. Of course. But ultimately, does that mean we'd have to reduce the 10% deduction to 5%? Mm. Uh, because what can the country afford? Mm. I know that we, we indicate they're doing part of the work of government and we mm. recognise that and that's why benefit is given uh, in terms of uh, many of the activities. But there is a cost involved. We can't factor that out and the fiscus is in need of funds. Indeed. We've also got abuse and we need to, if we re rectify all the abuse, mm. I'm sure there are probably some scope. Can I? But I think Treasury, yeah. you know, maybe we should have brought Treasury on mm. this on this mm. panel as well because it's a tax policy yeah. issue. Indeed. The, the, the issue was also that prior to this 2001 legislation, you mentioned something about the, the, the previous regime of ecclesiastical institutions. Mm. Now, at that time, uh, these organizations, religious organizations, were tax exempt. They were always tax exempt, yes, okay. but not tax deductible. There was one okay. tax deduction for a specific uh, Christian entity, mm -hmm. which was subsequently removed even prior to 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, so that mm -hmm. was removed uh, mm -hmm. prior to that. What about donor deductions for ecclesiastical? Never allowed. Mm -hmm. It was never allowed. So it was only for one entity specifically mm -hmm. uh, that it was allowed, and that was removed uh, even, I think it might have been prior mm -hmm. to 94, but it's a long time ago. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it was shortly after 94. I think it was a basis, the basis was to tidy up all discriminatory aspects, yes. for example, married, married people, yes. so on and so forth. So, so I think that was part of that but tidy up. Something perhaps one could revisit. Yes. Well, all I'm saying at the moment, it's an affordability treasury issue. and treasury needs to be involved. Yes. Obviously, ultimately, Parliament would pass the law. Correct. Yes. Uh, but it's 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 outside my ambit. I administer the law. But I think the the, the certainly the, the the very basic message out there is that for our viewers in particular, is that religion needs to be looked at separately. So don't just go and issue 18A certificates when you're giving to the masjids or the mosques. Correct. You need to exercise caution there and. The, the sort of the, the, the committee members need to be aware of this, number one. Number two, because it really traverses the humanitarian and the social aspects as well, there are ways of making sure that we do get the 18A deductions for valid uh, contributions, which are, which are really for, 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 for the non-religious uh, aspects of, of, of the work that the, the broader organizations are doing. 100%. And so the, the things like drilling a well in Beaufort West, which has been in very much uh, for the water yes. situation, that's a, that's a charitable activity. Absolutely. It might come out of flow from some religious uh, uh, organization, but the, 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 the work is charitable. Yes. I've been uh, just reminding, I've been asked to, ask the, to, to remind our, our viewers that this is a live program and we are opening up the lines for anybody that's got any specific questions around the topic at hand. It's uh, taxation of religious institutions uh, and we have an esteemed panel uh, you know, comprising of Mr. Mark Kinnan, our acting commissioner, Mr. Zain al Kaji from Okaf and Mr. Ahmed Juma, an independent tax practitioner. Oh, but let me bring the discussion to you uh, around if we're going to be looking at practical ways of dealing with some of SARS concerns and yet getting our organizations to be compliant, there's clearly a need to then look at some of the governance issues. You know, if we're setting up a separate entity, again, what's your experience in how that needs to be done and what are some of the practical issues that, 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 that our viewers need to be aware of? Okay, I think the, the first starting point is to draw a distinction between organizations that are relatively well organized and well resourced. Mm. They are able to seek and receive the advice that, that, that they, they desire. Um, and they are able to then put into place the administrative machinery uh, for compliance, mm -hmm. such as the mm -hmm. segregation between 18A activities and non-18A activities. It becomes highly cumbersome when the gog down the road mm -hmm. uh, notices that the kids walking past on the way to school uh, look quite famished and need uh, mm -hmm. feeding. Mm -hmm. so, so there's that kind of initiative as well. Mm -hmm. Now fortunately there is a provision in, in the law which allows, for example, the poor over type uh, PBOs, yes. the ones who, who facilitate, who yes. give out funds and so on and so the forth. Funding Fund to, the PBO to ensure this kind of compliance. Mm. Mm. Now, what I'd like to do, you know, publicly, uh, make an appeal to to the Muslim um, uh, and indeed all uh, uh, professionals, is that part of your time has to 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 be pro bono. 
you know. So please make yourself available to assist as well mm -hmm. the smaller uh, charities. And one mechanism could be that if there's, there's a provision for an association of PBOs, um, I have come across one particular advocate or, of this notion, and I think mm. it's an excellent notion, and that is there's a lot of overlap in charitable activities. Yes. And really, God is going to, to, Allah is going to be able to recognize what your intent is and what your action is. If you can cooperate and streamline the activities, you'd get better bang for your buck in terms mm -hmm. of the impact you have on the charitable intent yes. and you would have a better capacity to administer this. Yes. So in process towards that, I would recommend, for example, that the coordinating bodies yes. start looking at creating a unit yes. of volunteers who can actively go out there and assist mm -hmm. because it's not so much only the, the, the practical bringing to book Yes. of matters for compliance. It's the governance, the planning. Mm. And in that sense, I would go along with Mark that one segregates the activities mm. so that it's administratively transparent for SARS yes. and it's administratively transparent for, for us. Yes. And what that does is that it makes for happier compliance. Indeed. It makes for less cynicism on the part of SARS mm. because SARS has got a mandate. Mm. And we, as the, 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 on the other side, sitting as advisors, also have an obligation. We are legally obliged to advise what is correct. Mm, and indeed. beyond that, those who, who have the charitable intent uh, have to stick to their intent and not gratify their personal nafs or something yes. of that sort, mm. you know, their own egos. Mm. So I think that's the starting point, is mm. that it's, it's really an attitudinal issue. All the other issues of compliance and that can be resolved if we create capacity Mm. and we marry the capacity to the attitude. I think we should be yes. on, on the right path. Uncle Zainal, can I bring the, the discussion then to, again, maybe your role at OCAF of looking at this consolidation, is what I'm hearing, of possibly skills and expertise uh, to, to, to really get out a, 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 a much broader, more key message and service offering to our PBOs. Funder model is one, for example, getting people to understand that uh, you know, instead of doing everything, you can simply be a funder PBO and qualify. And that takes away the burden of you having to set up your little, let's say, mums and pops type of little PBOs all over the show. Compliance, uh, assisting with compliance on an umbrella body type uh, initiative. Taking these actions on an uh, industry body or wide initiative. Again, what is your sense of whether that's, that's been yeah. done, not done? I know that work's been done in... And is this where we should be moving towards? Yeah, I, th I think what we should do is uh, maybe set up a little bit of a broad-based commission mm. of professionals that would actually undertake, you know, f flowing from this discussion, looking at the various issues, and uh, be a body that would actually be representative of the broader Muslim community mm. and taking uh, some of the key stakeholders and having... Uh, discussions with them, bringing them together and, and then setting up this uh, body to actually uh, discuss, I think, uh, with, with SARS and at the same time having these road shows, which I think SARS would be very uh, accommodating as well, yeah. to have them in different centers uh, so that, uh, you know, the, the issue about education can be resolved, uh, compliance, mm. and I like the idea that Amma just mentioned, that mm. you could get a whole range of professionals. There's lots of mm. chartered accountants in, yes. in, in the community that can actually be uh, kind of allocated to different organizations and little uh, institutions mm. that can guide them along. And maybe, uh, you know, uh, the, the, we, we have associations like the Muslim Lawyers Association, the Association of Muslim Accountants and Lawyers, and I think those are the institutions that we need to uh, mobilize mm. to actually take this project further. We can mm. facilitate this, but uh, I think uh, on the ground they are the, 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 the people with the skills on hand and, and, and many of them have clients that are already, you know, organizations and they can uh, sort of um, promote the whole idea of compliance and, and look at... Uh, uh, what the issues are on the ground mm. and bring that back to this commission that can actually then talk to SARS and you know we can actually explore a lot more issues that that are 
facing our community as well. Yes, I think that's only one of the takeaways we're hopefully going to, when we conclude, remind our, our viewers on is what are the things that's coming out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, before, I think we're due for a next ad break. So before we get there, I want Ahmed maybe just for you to quickly take the viewers through some of the basic compliance checklists that they need to do. I know we don't want to focus on that, but I think that there's also lack of understanding of what needs to be done. You know, if it's a, if it's a trust, it's not just getting a trust document out there, but making sure that that meets the legislation and what the process often that, that, that needs to be done. Because that is what SARS looks at, is the compliance to the black letter of the law. I think the, the starting point is to, to look at what is the practical intent and then translate that into some kind of legal form. So the, the legal forms that in which um, a PBO can be registered is an uh, association governed by a constitution, which doesn't require any registration, mm. uh, a trust which requires the registration of the trust deed, uh, or a non-profit company which requires the registration of the memorandum and articles mm. of uh, memorandum of incorporation with the uh, company's registration um, Subsidy. authorities. Mm. So, so, so effectively what you have is you have a situation where the lettuce is the mm. law and then the link between the tax law and the, and the rest of the law is that you have to have certain uh, things that come out clearly, one of which is that you've got to have an objective that is substantively, primarily a public benefit activity mm, uh, right, yes. intent. So you have in the law two schedules which talk about what the public benefit activities are, welfare, uh, housing, so on and so forth. And then you have a second set which actually governs which institutions mm. can issue Section yes. 18A certificates, Correct. which uh, in effect allow for a deduction of contributions from the income tax of the contributor, Correct. not yes. the donation. Then you've got to have various uh, statements that effectively, not just ritualistically, but effectively demonstrate mm. that you are in fact going to uh, have three persons who will not be related to one another to mm. To sort this out because you have families who, who mm. organize something as a charity and then pretend mm. that this mm. is a charitable uh, organization meanwhile it's something else so you've got to have unrelated people so that you can have differences mm. because that's what governance about further requirements would include for example uh, that you will when you dissolve the pbo all of your um, mm. resources will in fact go over pour over yes to the uh, two succeeding PBOs. Yes. Um, so those are some of the some of the, the basic characteristics as to what SARS will look like. So your your constitution, your uh, your trust deed, or your memorandum and article uh, memorandum mm. of uh, incorporation have to have the various requirements that the legislation sets out that SARS can take off as being. Yes, this is in fact the case, mm. but I don't suspect that from my experience, SARS doesn't just ritualistically tick off. Mm. It looks at the substance of what you are saying. So for example, if you in the course of having doing nation building, decide you also want to fund, fund a political party, SARS Indeed. is going to say no, oh, yes. because that is expressly prohibited. Excluded. That's so, right. so, so that's the first port of call. Okay. Can I ask you to hold the thought? Yes. Because we've got to go and take another break. And we pick up on this discussion as soon as we're, we're done with that. And I just want to remind the viewers that it's a live program on ITV and that you can phone in with any of your questions on the topic of taxation of religious institutions. Welcome back uh, to all of our ITV viewers. Uh, this is a live uh, program dealing with the taxation of religious institutions. Uh, I know that many callers have been trying to call, but there seems to be some technical problems, so do continue. We'll try our best to try and connect you to our panel. Um, we're going to try. There seems to be one caller on the line. Uh, you're live on ITV. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear you? Yes, please go ahead with your question uh, to our panel. Okay, my name is Abdul Khan from the Association of uh, Muslim Accountants and Lawyers. Welcome, Abdul Khan. 
Um, are you still on the line there, Abdul? Yes, I'm with you. Please, can you go ahead with your question on uh, any aspect dealing with the taxation of religious institutions? Yes, first of all, just congratulate uh, you and the panel and IT for having such a program. It's really well needed in the community. Uh, basically, what I've called is this, just to announce that uh, the Association of Muslim Accountants are, in fact, holding a workshop on NPOs and PBOs. And uh, if you could just uh, perhaps mention three of yours, it's happening on the 12th of May, 2018, in Devon, at our work, at our offices. And, uh, and people could con contact us to, uh, to, to, to receive invitations to that, to be open to the public and to uh, NPOs and CBOs that would need assistance and guidance. Uh, I can also say that we have confirmed speakers from the tax exemption unit in Pretoria and from the NPO uh, uh, Department of Social Welfare in Pretoria as well. They will come in, be coming through to address all, um, uh, the attendees, and uh, I'm sure uh, we'll all learn enough from it. Thank you for that. I think it's exactly, the, it's exactly the kind of initiatives that we need to pursue um, within yes. the community to take this point uh, much further and much deeper. We've mm. barely touched on, I think, the issues, and the more engagement we have, uh, it will really be welcome. So thank you for that, uh, Abu. We've got another call on the line. Um, you're live on ITV. Hello. Yes, uh, please uh, uh, go ahead with your question. Who am I speaking to? Um, I'd like to remain anonymous. Okay. Please go ahead uh, with your question. It's going to do uh, with religious taxation. I just wanted to find out if uh, uh, PBO that uh, uh, wasn't registered before, what happened with the prior information about that? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mark, maybe for you? Okay, very importantly, and we've got a lot of this happening. Uh, you can come forward. There is a restriction as to how far the law goes back. It allows for a retrospective exemption to 2009. Mm. I have got some issues that I'm raising with Treasury because practically, what if I find a religious institution was there from the 1940s? Yes. I'm just being, uh, just to illustrate <laughs> the, the point. Mm. What do we do? You can't go back and, and go and try and dig all... We need to make some governance call on that. Mm. But the law does allow us to go back to 2009, mm. Mm. at which time it was passed. I think it was 1 January 2009 yes. mm. that it allowed. So it does allow. I would really recommend, if there are tax issues, now there's two facets, mm. income tax for, for exemption, that's easy. You approach the tax exemption unit, mm. uh, specifically the details on the mm. SAS website. With regards to pay as you earn, that's mm. a different issue. Yes. And uh, I would really recommend that they approach the voluntary disclosure unit, make a disclosure, mm. and there are certain amounts that would be payable in terms of that. And I, that would be my recommendation. Yes, thank you for that, Mark. Um, Ahmed, I want to bring just uh, back the discussion that we had and close that one before we took the break around some of the, the practical issues around compliance. Um, you gave a very nice overview of, of some of the areas we needed to deal with in terms of the company and the trust registrations and those sort of things. Um, sometimes the problems seem to be around the funder uh, PBOs. Uh, there's some specific requirements there, if I recall, around the distribution of funds. Maybe you want to share a bit of that. And that's the model we want to try and aspire to. And then also maybe just your thoughts on uh, how, some of the compliance issues around 18 and Mark. Please, you can also come in on this point because sure. I think you're seeing it a lot mm. uh, from, from SARS perspective. Correct. Okay, f firstly, um, <coughs> when it comes to, to funding PPOs, historically SARS only permitted um, or insisted on 75% of whatever they received to be distributed within a specific period of time. Mm. Um, and I suspect the underlying policy objective is to prevent a damming up of of funds mm. that effectively earn a lot of uh, interest and so yes. on mm. and don't have the impact that they meant mm. to. But I think what has happened based on representations because you know uh, opportunities arise, you need to hold reserves if you have an international crisis for example mm. uh, where, or, or an earthquake or something of that sort even in South Africa. So what you would require, and I don't think the international uh, one is, uh, uh, is a good example, let's look at a, a, mm. a, a catastrophe yes. in South Africa, a flood. Yes. So you obviously need to hold reserves, and SARS has conceded that 50% yes. yes. should be 
uh, expended. So 50% can be kept back and 50% has okay. to be expended, dispersed, expended, dispersed, into, dispersed. Into, into the activity yeah. that yeah. it's funding and the recipients mm. must be conducting public benefit activities. Yes. Yeah. I think very importantly to link to that, obviously the 50% rule was recently changed. Yes. We have allowed that where there's a specific project, so you've got for instance a school hall mm. and going up and you're never going to collect or be able to, to put all the funds in one kitty, I'm now talking of the funder, yes. in one kitty in one year we do allow an accumulation. The intention, we don't mm. want people just creating endowments in yes. terms of, of, of the funding model. Mm. Uh, remember though, the 50% rule does not apply to the doer. That's right. It's it the, only it's the applies funder. to the funder. Yes. So uh, I think that's very important. Yes. Uh, Amit, then uh, the 18A is the other one I want to spend a bit of time with because there seems to be a lot of confusion within the community around 18A. You, know, you often hear the ads on the radio, we're going to issue 18A certificate. Uh, and I wonder whether that qualifies as an 18A uh, itself. So again, just for, the, for our viewers to understand when does 18A apply, um, clearly religious institutions do not, and that's one of the problems that Mark and his team have picked up. Uh, so a bit of the compliance around that, if you, if you can recall. And again, Mark, please do come yeah, in on sure. the technicalities. Okay. Basically, with 18A, you've got to be able to... Um, you only have capacity to issue 18A certificates if you have public benefit activities that in fact are mm. second schedule activities. Now mm. I know that sounds like a highly technical approach, but mm. it's a shorter list than the uh, first schedule activities, which are broader, including uh, religious uh, activities. Yes. So the, the school issue, the madrasa rather than mm. a Muslim school, yes. is, is, is a good example that the madrasa would be regarded as a religious educational institution or a cultural yes. institution, whereas, uh, you know, uh, uh, Islamic school, the madrasa activity within there is almost incidental. Mm, mm, mm. Now, um, I think that that, that fault line ha where you need to cons have consultation for every single activity that you have and only issue 18A mm. certificates in respect of those activities where it's permitted. Mm. So mm. I think that distinction yes. is as thick as mud in mm. the minds of some people. Yes. And understandably so, because it's a subtlety that even baffles the minds of uh, tax professionals. Indeed, yeah. yes. So, and even SARS, and there are specific circumstances mm. that arise which then need to be lobbied. Mm. And the problem, not speaking on behalf of SARS, but having been there at one point, mm. Uh, the problem is that you, you, you have a situation where you can't make a, the exception the basis for yeah. a concession. Indeed. So that is, that is the, the, the one uh, difficulty. Mm. I think that you have difficulties also in the sense that you have those who just willfully and not having applied their minds, yes. go out and issue 18A yeah, certificates. Yes. Now, there's a, there's a reconciliation process on the part of SARS. SARS is able to detect whether this 18A certificate is, is being issued by an organization that is indeed registered for that mm, particular mm. issuance. Yes. And then the second inquiry, of course, is to whether it's tied to the activity. Mm, that's right. So, so I would suggest that, and I'd like to think that the bulk of those who, who, who default, default because of their ignorance. Mm. We hope. But, we hope, indeed. But, but as, as is, is coming through in the press across religions, uh, there are those who, who see religion as a nice enterprising mm. activity and this concept of mm. God profits mm. them much. Mm. So, so they play <laughs> on people's and, sensitivities. And, and, and Mark, really this strikes at, I mean, uh, you know, non-compliance with this really strikes at the heart of the PBO itself, isn't Correct. it? Because and it's a PBO that's issuing those certificates. Correct. And I think the, the knock-on impact on that PBO, we can tax those receipts. Indeed, yes. And, and at, 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 at top rate of a company. But I just want to go back. The, the starting point is it has to be a donation. Yes. And there's so often that this misconception, I'm, I, I pay for a four ball at a golf tournament. Is that a donation or not? Is, is it a donation? <laughs> I pay for a table mm. at an event. Is mm. that a donation or mm. not? And you know, if you go look at the, the, the tax court's rulings over many, many years, if anything, obligation is placed on the recipient of that donation mm. to give me, the donor, anything, it's mm. not a donation. So that's the starting point. There mm. has, it's, it's a free will gift 
that I'm giving to the organization mm. without an obligation yes. in return. You know, you're not going to allow me to sit next to so-and-so, which is something happening mm. because I made that donation. Mm. That's giving you something. Mm. Uh, that's the starting point Correct. that I really want uh, people to understand. Just to get to the problems that we're getting, mm. and, uh, is, is, and, and it's outside the religious sector, but it impacts yes. uh, in the broader. We find people paying school fees to the school and they get issued an 18A donation. <laughs> so that's the practical outpouring yes. of that. And that's just tot that's with respect, it's fraud. Yes. Uh, yeah. That is, is disguising something which it, uh, in, in a certain disguise. Indeed. The other thing is people who are not approved as 18A entities, they never applied mm. in terms of what they said to us, but they're issuing 18A receipts mm. to, to people who are mm. giving uh, their, 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 their gifts to the entity. Yes. So uh, that's the, the one. The other one is also we're having many people creating fictitious receipts. Mm. In other words, they say, and now this is on the mm. donor's side, yes. they're creating a receipt that I gave mm. X entity money. Yes. And this is, brings forward Mahond, what we have to work towards ultimately. Just like an IRP5 on employment is reconciled back to the That's tax right. return, we're needing a donation from entity A to be uh, reconciled back to the tax return yes. that the two can't happen in isolation. Yes, we need indeed. that reconciliation. Now, that's a journey ahead and in terms of SARS, we'd like to get there because there's risk when we don't match. Yes. We've got some improvements we've made, uh, it was uh, alluded to, that we, we, we are matching in terms mm. of numbers. Yes. But if I get the number, I can still fraudulently, yes. I want to bring in that ultimately we'd pre-populate the data we get from that charity Correct, yes. into the tax return yes. that you can't get anything beyond that. Yes. So this is, is this, uh, some of these problems, would you say they're systemic or are they generally isolated? Uh, and the, the 18A one, the fraudulent one, is the first time I heard of that. But are you seeing a lot of this happening? We're seeing considerable amounts in certain space in the personal income tax space mm. where people are claiming fictitious certificates uh, for, for, for tax deductions. Mm. Uh, it's not, you know, 80 percent plus of people want to do the right thing. Let's, yes. uh, you know, the, for me that's very clear. It's the, the fraudsters find gaps and then they, they harvest out of those gaps to maximize whatever they're trying to maximize. Yes. And that's where we've got to start our focus and close those gaps. Great stuff. I think we're almost at the end uh, of our time for this slot. So I'm going to maybe ask, starting with Uncle Zainal, your final thoughts um, as we wrap up the session. Then over to Ahmed and then Mark, I'll, I'll get you to, to say the last word before I do a final close. Yeah, I think, uh, I th I think that uh, this whole issue about uh, creating awareness is quite an important issue. And I like the attitude of SARS that, you know, this is basically uh, an educational rather than a witch hunt, uh, you know, cause yes. that is being undertaken at the moment. And, uh, you know, from the uh, Okaf South Africa perspective, it was merely... Uh, exactly the issue about creating this kind of awareness. Yes. I'm glad that uh, Association of Muslim Accountants and Lawyers is also taking it up in yes. Durban and hopefully uh, this will happen in the Cape and other centres as well. Yes. But I think ultimately we need that uh, community tax commission mm. that, uh, the, that, that is going to represent the PBO sector or the NGO sector yes. that will take on issues and that will uh, have an engagement, a constructive engagement mm. with SARS on the particular issues that we as a sector actually uh, constitute. And, and bring consistency to that. Yes, as well. absolutely. Good. Thank you, Uncle Zainal. Ahmed, 30 seconds I've been told. Okay. Basically, from my point of view, if we can demonstrate compliance, then I think we'd have a happier relationship with the authorities, number one. Number two, it would also prevent any exogenous considerations mm. coming into mm. play. For example, in a political climate where um, you have NGOs descend on South Africa for their own political uh, nefarious or otherwise mm. activities, government responds and then the tax law can be mm. utilized yes. to, to, to prevent that. I'm saying that let's take that off the table, let's make sure that whatever is done is done correctly by the book. and appropriately and by the book so that this enables the Muslim community to demonstrate its impact in society in terms of the welfare uh, activities thank that it you. conducts. Mark? Firstly, thank you very much and this is the type of engagement we want. Number one, we want to work together with any community mm -hmm. to ensure compliance with law. All we want is people to do the right thing. That's all. 
Nothing yes. beyond, nothing less. Yes. Do the right thing, act within the constraints of the law. Let's talk, let's find a way ahead. But thank you. I think thank you to you, Mark, in particular, and obviously to the rest of our panellists, but I know your time is pretty challenged, and this is the kind of engagement that we certainly want to take forward, uh, whether it's through OCAF, whether it's with SARS, whether it's with the private practitioners, and all the various other Muslim institutions and organisations. So I think it's an open invitation now to, to really move forward on this particular issue. So I think, uh, certainly listeners I hope, uh, and viewers, I hope that you guys found this useful and beneficial. Um, and uh, certainly something that uh, we were, we're going to progress further, inshallah, if we can. Um, and I think at that, we, we now come to a close of the program. So thank you very much. Fia uh, Manila. Until next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.